Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ancient World Magazine podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Browers, and today's subject will be chariots in the ancient world. I'm joined by contributing editor Dr. Joshua Hall, regular contributor Dr. Ariana Sacco, and special guest Dr. Sylvain and Gerard. We will briefly introduce ourselves. I'm Joshua Hall. Uh, my research specialism is early Italy, notably the Etruscans, Romans, and Western Greeks. Um, I'm here today because the Etruscans liked their chariots and their carts, and it seemed like a good place to talk about them. Hello, I'm Arianna Sacco. Yeah, my field is uh, Egyptian archaeology. I'm here because of all the Egyptian chariots that are represented on the relief. They are depicted also in tombs. Hi, I'm Sylvan and Gerard. I study military developments in the Hellenistic period, especially the Seleucid Empire. And I'm here today to talk about the Scythe Chariot, which is sort of a Persian and invention that we see develop in the Hellenistic period as well. So it's going to be fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my name is Joshua Browers. I'm uh, an archaeologist by training. I've written about Greek warfare and I'm the editor-in-chief of Ancient World magazine. Uh, I think, first of all, we need to define what a chariot is precisely. A chariot is a, is a wheeled vehicle, which isn't very helpful because um, anything with, with wheels is a wheeled vehicle. So, But this distinguish it from uh, wagons, which usually... Uh, technically, strictly speaking, have four wheels, and carts, which normally have uh, two wheels. A chariot, like a cart, has two wheels, but the main distinction is that it's light, has wheels that have spokes, uh, and that it's drawn by horses rather than other draft animals. Uh, Usually used in warfare, but we'll also, of course, touch upon other uh, aspects, uh, like chariot races and that sort of thing. Um, But that's basically what a chariot is and how we can distinguish it from, you know, heavier wagons and uh, simpler carts and that sort of thing. Carts and wagons, of course, can be pushed by people or drawn by animals like uh, donkeys or mules or oxen or whatever. And chariots always are drawn by a team of horses. Two horses in the Bronze Age and later in the Iron Age, teams of four horses are introduced as well. Don't forget the relatively rare but awesome trigas, the three horse-drawn chariots for which we have a little bit of evidence, at least from Etruria. Yeah, there's also, sometimes they have like spare, or what they think are spare horses, because I think, was it the Assyrians, or where they have five horses, but it's basically, it's teams of four horses, and then there's a spare horse that that runs alongside in case one of the horses gets incapacitated, something along those lines. Maybe Sylvanan will know also, because it's later, so it's... uh... They tend to just have four horses in the time I look at. I mean, in processions, you sometimes get elephants pulling the chariots, but that's not on the battlefield, that doesn't happen at all on the battlefield. No, I, I can imagine having two or four elephants draw a chariot might be uh, n- not as maneuverable <laughs> as you <laughs> might want on the battlefield. So we can we can sort of talk a little bit uh, briefly about all the, uh, about let's say, uh, early predecessors for the, the chariot just to sort of set the stage. Chariot is not is only possible if you have uh, the wheel, which is invented uh, in the uh, Neolithic. At some point between 4500 and 3500 BC, different places of the world, it's not exactly clear what the connection is between these different regions. And the invention of the wheel, initially maybe for pottery first, and then later also used for uh, vehicles, leads to the development of wagons and carts, etc., etc. And then you have an early use, or military use of a wheeled vehicle, is those um, Sumerian uh, battle carts that you see uh, for example, the standard of Ur, where you have all these images of these uh, battle carts. It's also on the uh, the Stella de Vultures, I think, which is stone. So you have these battle carts, uh, four wheels drawn by uh, onagers, which are like these wild asses, basically. Um, and they have these solid wheels. So it's very unlikely that these would have been used on the battlefield itself, but instead were probably used to transport people to and from the battlefield and all that sort of stuff. And the earliest... Chariots were probably developed during the Middle Bronze Age, and you have some evidence for the earliest, certainly attested evidence for chariots dates to around uh, the, the 17th century, uh, which is in um, Anatolia, if I recall correctly. And then you get stuff like Hittite texts by uh, Kikuli the Mitanni, a man from Mitanni, uh, who is a master horse trainer who's written a text about how to train chariot horses, basically. And then you get into the, the late Bronze Age, and um, that's when chariots are really well attested, for example, in ancient Egypt. Yeah, so the first chariot in um, battle in Egypt are used from in the second half of the um, second millennium BC. 
So we're talking about the, the late Bronze Age, right after the second intermediate period. So first we had the second intermediate period uh, so until 1550 with the reign of Ixus in the north because Egypt so what in the second intermediate period was divided politically and culturally with the Ixos dynasty, so this dynasty of uh, Eastern origins from the Levant reigning there and they are credited with introducing the use of the war chariot in Egypt because the first mention is in this uh, stela of Kamosem uh, which is uh, a stela where one of the last kings of the 17th dynasty which was the dynasty that was reigning in uh, in upper Egypt so in the south and was also the dynasty that managed to chase the Ixos dynasty away. So anyways, it's the, um, the stela where this king from this southern dynasty uh, talks about his battles against the northern dynasty, against the Ixos dynasty. And there, he made, it, there is a mention of the Ixos using the, the, the chariot. Uh, the interesting thing is that even though there have been in, in the capital city of the Ixos, Avaris, which is modern Tel Adaba, have been found uh, burials with horses, oh, so every found remains from horses, but there's not really something that can be connected to the, to the war chariot. So they are uh, credited with that, but it's actually nothing archaeologically apart from this uh, mention on the stela. There's nothing else that they can actually prove it from the archaeological remains. So anyways, you, you have this intermediate period with the Ixos in the north, and another dynasty in the south to, to make it very simple. And then the southern dynasty uh, managed to reunite Egypt, chase the Ixos away, the Ixos dynasty away. Again, I'm, I'm making it very simple. And from there, so from this, uh, from what is then conventionally known as the New Kingdom, and, this, and the new dynasty, which is known then as the 18th dynasty, then we see the use of the war chariot in Egypt. And what characterizes it is that it's very, very light and can go relatively fast because I think it's, yeah, it has been experimented and could go up to uh, nearly 40 kilometers per hour. So the main feature is that it's very light. So basically it's, very, it's made of this uh, very light uh, wood frames. Uh, the platform is is wide but is is narrow and is like very airy and open uh, also on the sides. I mean sometimes that the, the frame can be covered by uh, fabric, can be covered by leather and there is also an example in wood from a royal tomb. Uh, so the wheels had between four and eight books. The tradition is the Ixos introduced that but I think maybe we need more archaeological evidence mm -hmm. for that. I, I don't want absolute, I absolutely don't want to, de to uh, discredit the idea, but I, I don't know. I think we need more evidence. Yeah, so in, in Egypt, how did they use them precisely in battle? Well, they could be used as platforms to throw long range weapons. So for, it was uh, mostly for bow and arrows. Uh, so you would have a driver and another person, so it was for two people, and you would have a driver and another, uh, and then the other person throwing the, the arrow, or they could also be spares. So they would throw spares, javelins. There are also representations of people driving it alone, especially the kings, and they put the reins against the waist, and so they have the hand free, the hands free to to throw the arrows. Yeah, yeah, that's something you see a lot. Also, I think in Etruscan art, there is this uh, uh, chariot with Athena on it or something, and she also she she drives it on her own, if I recall correctly. There's this bronze uh, figurine, so it's it's something that's very old. No, you you're probably right. I I don't know that particular artifact. Um, in 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 terms of Etruscan chariots and warfare, uh, a lot of the representations are along the lines of like the they're very Hellenized. They're the um, uh, what do we call them these days? Like the departing warrior scenes of someone who is kitted out to look like a hoplite, either getting on or off a chariot. Personally, I don't think they were used in warfare. 
really in in Etruria, but we can get to that later. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're gonna get to that. Let, let's let's uh, stay a bit here. I mean, one of the the first, one of the, the earliest known battles where we have some details, even though we don't know the exact outcome, is the Battle of Kadesh in twelve seventy four BC, which uh, pits the uh, army of Ramesses II against the Hittites, and it's this massive engagement with thousands of chariots and there's a whole detailed description of how the battle went and according to Ramesses of course he won but it's not exactly clear if if he did I mean with the ancient Egyptian <laughs> sources there's always a hefty dose of, of royal propaganda no but especially the chariots were used a lot in propaganda because especially in the in the Ramesside period so during the the 19th the 20th dynasty you see the chariots represented on, on temple walls. So you have these wall reliefs when the chariot is prominent and when the king in the chariot is prominent. And I mean, you have the, the huge figure of the king in the chariot and all the other soldiers in the, in the chariots are way smaller than him. And, and so all the importance is just given to him, to, to the king. So they, they were used a lot for for propaganda in Egypt. Yeah, and chariots remain important also in Assyrian reliefs, for example, the king in the chariot hunting lion. That sort yeah, of thing. yeah, but there it's like you see more, I say, equalitarian mm-hmm. status. Uh, no, what I mean is that it's not. It, it, there is a different feeling. My opinion is that there is a different feeling to it in Assyria. And there we're also talking about the Iron Age. We're talking about a way later period when the chariot wasn't used that much in battle. Uh, I mean, with Egypt, we are talking about late Bronze Age and there was the peak, the Ramesside, also the Ramesside era, there was the peak of the use of the chariot in battle. Uh, with the Assyrians, so with the Near Assyrians, that that wasn't the case anymore. Just to return to the Battle of Kadesh, because it's interesting because there are depictions that also show the the Hittite army and the Hittite chariots, and compared to the Egyptian ones, the Egyptian ones have a driver and usually an archer, and the Hittite ones have three people aboard, which is uh, a driver, usually uh, an archer, and a guy with a, a shield and or uh, a spear, probably to, to fend off uh, you know close range attack and whatever. And there's an interesting little mistake in the Egyptian reliefs in that the the axle of of the wheels is put all the way at the back of the chariot, like an Egyptian chariot. Uh, but with the Hittite chariots, we know that those axles were more in the in the center, so they could carry a heavier load. That's one one major difference. But we don't exactly know how the Hittites used their chariots. They may have used them like the uh, like the Egyptians as a, as mobile platforms for ranged warfare. But uh, it's not exactly clear. Some people have argued that that those spears were also used for um, for thrusting, which sort of brings us to the Aegean, which I will quickly. Uh, uh, talk about because there's also a lot of stuff on chariots on the Ancient World Magazine website so I don't have to rehash a lot but of course Bronze Age, Greece and Crete also had uh, chariots but those uh, chariot armies were far smaller than what you see in, in Asia and in North Africa, in, in, in Egypt so we have like these tablets from uh, the Palace of Knossos uh, so during the Mycenaean era, so from let's say uh, 1400 BC onwards uh, where there's this, this list of 400 partial chariots and you know they shouldn't be taken as that the Knossos army that the Knossos army fielded 400 chariots because these were also incomplete chariots also chariot parts and stuff but you know it's it's fairly clear from this number which which must have been large for for Greek uh, standards that it's it's uh, tiny compared to the to the thousands of chariots that the Hittites and the Egyptians were able to field but chariots are in uh, are used in uh, bronze in the bronze age Aegean and there again is the question how were they used because the landscape of course isn't as uh, suitable for chariot warfare so so there are some uh, grave stelae from Mycenae itself, from Grave Circle A. Uh, so these predate the, the uh, palace proper period, let's say, uh, that show chariots apparently with spearmen running down uh, hapless victims. Uh, so the idea is that maybe they used them in chariot charges with spears, and that, that seems very unlikely. Later frescoes from the palaces themselves, so let's say the, the 13th century BC, we see chariots with uh, spearmen, and where the the idea is that most likely these guys were 
transported to the battlefield, they dismounted and then they fought on foot. And this is something that you see also in the early Iron Age in Greek geometric art. You have these, these spearmen, they get on chariots, they go to the battlefield, they get off and they fight. And you also see this in archaic Greek art, even though by that time, and we'll get there, the question is, did they still use chariots or not? Anyway, the basic idea is the chariots in the, in the Bronze Age Aegean and also later in Greece were used as a mode of conveyance, as it's, as it's put. And this is, of course, very similar to Homeric style warfare. If you read the Homeric epics, you also have, you know, the, the heroes and their drivers, they get on a chariot and they drive to the battlefield. The hero leaps off, fights, and then when he needs to retreat, he gets back on his chariot and drives off. So that's something that's, that's fairly typical for uh, the Aegean, at least. We, I mentioned the Sumerian battle cards at the beginning that were probably also used in a similar way. Some people have argued that this is a completely unnatural way of using the chariot, that it's a waste of a chariot not to, not to take it into battle because nothing is more imposing than seeing hundreds if not thousands of chariots are, are coming towards you, you know, with all these wild men aboard. But yeah, it, it depends very much on the, on the landscape circumstances and of course also cultural aspects and it seems that in the Aegean chariot chargers, well they would have been very difficult to do also with the rocky uh, soil. So this is sort of the, the early period. Of course, uh, eventually chariots, I won't say they, they disappear because they don't. They remain in use, of course, but the, how they're used changes a little bit uh, because they're replaced by true cavalry as they say, so by people that are on horses and that use the horse as a, as to, to wade into battle and to fight, basically. And exactly how they do, we, we'll probably touch upon that later, or, or not. <laughs> but the, the, the question is always, why did, they, why did they not ride horses from the very beginning? Why did they use chariots? Because if you have to use two horses and a chariot and a separate driver and one guy basically fighting, that's a very expensive, inefficient way of waging war. So why didn't they just use cavalry? And the answer is that we don't really have an answer for that because we don't exactly know why they did one thing and not the other. Some people have suggested that people stopped using chariots when sturdier horses were available and they could they could have these, these war horses that they rode into battle. But yeah, the, the evidence for that is, is simply not there as far as I know. Uh, also, if you look at later Greek depictions of horses, they ride these ponies, very cute little ponies, and they seem to be exactly the same as what they use for chariots. So it's like, what does this mean? And it's not like in the late Bronze Age, they didn't know how to ride these animals because there are depictions in Egypt reliefs from the from the New Kingdom of people riding horses. They are on horseback and they're messengers and scouts also from But Mycenaean. they're not that common either. No, I mean, no, they're not common. It's not but something I mean, that they were doing. No, exactly. Not. No, no. But I mean also from Mycenaean Greece there, there's uh, vase paintings and there are figurines of guys on horseback riding. There's one vase painting, I forget the exact date, but it has like this, this scene of a, a chariot preceded by a guy on a horse. So, you know, they were familiar with horse riding. So the question is, why didn't they just say, you know, forget about the chariot, forget about that driver, just stick all these people on horses, give them a spear or a bow and, and have at it. But for some reason they didn't do that. And that's an interesting... I don't know, maybe because it takes another set of skills to use weapons while riding the horse? Maybe. Peter Greenhall in his book on early Greek warfare has a whole thing where he says that uh, Homer's description of chariots used as, as uh, transport vehicles is nonsensical. He says he was familiar with a different thing, which is what we see in archaic Greek art, of a guy riding to battle on a horse with a squire next to him. And when they arrive at the battlefield, he jumps off, the squire takes the horses to safety, and the guy goes and fights. He says, this is what Homer meant. And he, he, did, he deliberately archaized by using chariots, which is utterly nonsensical, because why would Homer do that? It, that would sort of presuppose that he knew that, you know, back, you know, in the age of heroes, they all used chariots, which doesn't make any sense. So it's, there's nothing unnatural about using chariots as a, as a mode of conveyance. The, the question is why stop using chariots and, and start using real cavalry? Why does that change? And we don't really know still. I mean, there's evidence from the Hellenistic period of cavalry and chariots being used in tandem. I know the Carthaginians did this, and I have no explanation for that because for all of the reasons that you just said, it doesn't make sense to me why you would take chariots to battle when you have effective cavalry. Yeah, and that's something I have to ask myself when I look at the Seleucid army, like, why do they still have the chariots? And you see also in India, they've got this idea of the fourfold army, which is chariots, elephants, cavalry, and infantry. So it's like, well, you've got elephants and cavalry. What do you need chariots for at this point? Now, at that point, you sort of think it's also partially, you know, just a status thing. 
you know yeah i mean i'm i i'm a big and powerful warlord and i have i have loads of infantry and i have loads of horses and i have loads of elephants and look i even have chariots as well yeah see what <laughs> i can do yeah, exactly something like that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so for example when you look at, the, at at egyptian and hittite armies it's basically it's an infantry corps with with a uh, a large chariot army chariot division or chariot divisions basically operating as this as this this strike force basically it's these massive armies and you don't have like where you're like you know why don't you just sit on the horses instead <laughs> it'll be easier etc so it's it's partially also the psychological element where you uh, see could all also these... be that you need maybe i don't know if you would need that many more horses if you want to do cavalry instead of chariots I no because you're also having more horses? it takes two horses per chariot and of yes, course later because... with the assyrians when they the, the, the neo-assyrians later from the 8th century onwards i yeah. think they have like these very heavy chariots with these massive wheels and, yeah. and four horses and a whole bunch of guys in the chariot. You know, and you're like, okay, why, why don't you stick them all on, on these horses? But there must also be this, this psychological aspect to it where, you know, if, you, if you're just a guy and you see a guy on a horse approaching you, you're like, okay, I'm just going to spear the horse and I'm done with it. But if you see like four horses with this chariot behind it and all those dudes on there, you're like, uh-oh. So I guess something like that must be. But yeah, it, it's... <clears throat> Chariots, I mean, thinking about it like that, chariots let you put more horses onto a battlefield with fewer men. So if the, if in your mind the purpose is to just put a bunch of beasts running at, running at your enemy, then it's more efficient because you're risking fewer human lives. And if you have a smaller man, uh, pool of manpower to draw from. Maybe. Maybe that's one way of l making it sound more reasonable. I mean, horses are pretty terrifying anyway when they start charging at you that there's evidence of like i think it was in the napoleonic period of veteran infantry getting a bit scared when the cavalry is charging at them and that's when you know the horse isn't oh it's going to do its best not to stand on you it's really only the guy on the top you have to worry about so if you've got all these horses and then the cars and then the men in it yeah maybe it's to add to that psychological aspect yeah because the the amount of dust that it kicks off also, I mean the, the the chariots going through the sand and the dust. It 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 creates these massive clouds that impair visibility. If you, if you want some idea of what a massive battle in the ancient world may have looked like, you should watch uh, Oliver Stone's Alexander because that's the, the only movie I think that does a good job at uh, sort of accurately giving an idea of what an ancient battle looked like with all the with all the the chaos and the mayhem and the dust and everything else um that that's um, a recommendation but speaking of going into wading into battle with these with these chariots i mean if we've talked about the egyptian chariots and the hittite chariots and the the mycenaean chariots and what they all have in common is that they don't get close to the enemy ranks i mean the 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 Egyptian chariots, they're basically mobile uh, archer platforms, so they, they shoot these arrows from afar. Yep. And uh, they, they don't let their horses and their chariots get near the enemy because, you know, it's very easy to... Uh, the, these chariots are very light. You can you can easily smash them. Uh, if you do a weird maneuver and you hit a rock, you, you have a chance of toppling it over. Horses are vulnerable, of course, to being attacked. So Sylvanum, to sort of leap forward to the Hellenistic era, when I'm thinking about the, the, the scythe chariots, which is... You know, you basically have the, these fragile uh, vehicles with these fragile animals and you turn those into weapons, basically, that you send into crowds. How, how does that work exactly? And how... Yeah, so the Scythe Chariot is, unlike earlier chariots, it's a close combat chariot. So it's intended to actually get right up close to the enemy and do some damage. Otherwise, there'd be no point of putting the Scythes on it, other than they look impressive. Now, just like with the Egyptian chariots, the whole origin of the scythe chariot is debated we're not entirely sure when they first came into being so our ancient sources both disagree our modern scholars disagree and no one really agrees with anyone so xenophon in his cyropedia so his education of cyrus the great this sort of semi-fictional work claims that cyrus the great is the one who invents these in the run-up to the battle of sardis in 547 bc but Xenophon also tells us that Cyrus the Great is the one who revolutionises all of the Persian army, so we might want to take some of his claims here with a grain of salt. Um, but he did see the Persian army in action at the Battle of Kunaxa in 401 BC, so he knows 
some of what he says is bound to be correct. Whether it's true of the 6th century when Cyrus the Great is around is another matter entirely. Then on the other hand, we have Catesias's Persica, which unfortunately only survives in fragments now. So we don't have the full um, account from Catesias. And he claims that the scythe chariot is made by the legendary Assyrian king Ninus, so husband of the famed Babylonian queen Semiramis. And he says that, you know, they had over 10,000 scythe chariots in one of their campaigns. And once again, we're moving into the sort of semi-mythical territory, so it's hard to tell whether Catesius has got any of those details right. 10,000 scythe chariots is a lot of chariots, even for an area that did have a big chariot core. And 10,000 sounds like a rather rounded number anyway, so it's a bit suspicious. So that's what the ancient sources tell us. So it's a little confused what they think. And then there are two main arguments in the modern scholarship. So Nefford Kinn in 2004 argued that he says, right, Xenophon and Catesios are both wrong and that the scythe chariot is developed under Artaxerxes I uh, between 467 and 458 BC at the time when the Persians are getting ready to go and invade Egypt. And he says... They've made the scythe chariot very particularly to fight the Athenian allies of the Egyptians. So these are made to fight the hoplite. Because he said, cavalry can't charge hoplites, so this is what the chariots are done. Now, I have quite a few problems with that idea, but we'll get to that in a moment. The other idea was put forward by Rop in 2013, and he says it just makes a bit more sense for these chariots to have been invented in the late Neo-Assyrian period when they're starting to make the chariots a little bit heavier and there's other military developments. And he says, we shouldn't worry that, oh, we don't hear about them in Darius's army or Xerxes's army in the Persian Wars, because it's like Greece, as we've noted, is not the best place to bring your chariots. And he says that these chariots are made for the big flat plains in Mesopotamia. That's where they're going to work. As we said, we need flat area for chariots to work you don't want them over rocks it's a good way to just completely overturn them so that's the origins it's a bit confused but either way the persians definitely have scythe chariots and then this rather interestingly continues through the hellenistic world so the seleucids they're heirs to alexander's eastern empire but they're also heirs to the persians so this is clearly a weapon they've got from their Persian ancestors. But it's quite interesting that they continue to use it because, as we will see in a moment, that the Scythe Chariot is an interesting weapon that sometimes it's successful and other times it is absolutely disastrous. As for what it looked like, um, as we said, this is a heavier chariot, so it's not quite as light as what we've seen the problem with understanding its appearance is we don't actually have any iconographical evidence of a scythe chariot. There are plenty of reliefs of chariots. None of them have scythes. That's a bit of a problem when we want to try and understand, well, what did they look like? It's possible that those reliefs did have scythes, but they were actually metal additions to like the sculptures and that they've since been lost or people have robbed them. So now it's just a chariot and not a scythe chariot. So we're left with our literary descriptions. That is the further problem here is that out of all the people who describe them, only Xenophon saw them in action. So he's the only one with first hand experience of what this weapon actually looks like. So I would say, yes, the Cyropedia is a semi fictional account. His claims that Cyrus the Great invented them are probably dubious. But I think we can trust his description of them because he did personally see them. The other authors, such as Livy, Quintus Curtius, Theodorus, didn't see them. And that's when we start to get a few more confused details as to what they actually look like. But I think if we combine all those descriptions together, we get a general idea. So, as we've mentioned, because these are heavier chariots, you need four horses to actually pull them. They're yoked side by side, and that obviously requires training to get all those horses to work together. So when we were saying, well, why don't they just put men on the horses? It would 
be a lot more cost effective to just put men on the horses rather than having to train a team to actually work together. And it's also reasonable to assume that these are fairly robust horses. You can get some very good bulky horses from the medium plains, especially, which would be sort of southwestern around today. Um, it was known for some very good high quality horses. But again, that adds to the expense of these um weapons but again also the prestige because it's like look at all the things i can afford that it doesn't matter how much it costs so xenophon tells us that chariots themselves are made from strong timbers so like we mentioned that the earlier chariots were a lot lighter xenophon's very keen to tell us that these are a lot stronger and that the axles around the wheels have been strengthened so that they don't overturn in quite the same way and he says that there's a box around the driver so to protect the driver, I'm not sure whether they have anyone else in a scythe chariot or whether it is just the driver or whether it depends on circumstance. We don't get many details about who else is in that, but that's also because it's the actual chariot that is the weapon at this point. It's not necessarily meant as this mobile platform for archers or javelins. So the scythes, which are the most interesting and unusual part of this chariot, we're told that there are two steel scythes attached to the wheels or the axles and they're about three foot or about nine, just short of a metre long. And then we're also told that there are scythes that point towards the ground as well. So that's to catch anyone who falls under the chariot. So they look pretty terrifying. You've got all these glinting scythes sticking out of it. Livy also claims that... that there are two horn-like projections on the yoke. And he says that they're 10 cubits long, which would be the equivalent of like 15 feet or four and a half meters, which just sounds incredibly bizarre. It's like, that is like the equivalent of attaching one of the sarissas, so one of the pikes, to your chariot. It just seems incredibly bizarre. Now, if you want those to point forward, if for them to be of any use, they would actually have to go beyond the horses, so maybe it's not too weird. But it doesn't seem to match anything that we hear elsewhere. And some scholars have said, rather than decum, which is the Latin for ten, Livy actually meant duo, which is two, and that would match all the other sort of scythes that we know are on this chariot. And just seems a lot more feasible than having this giant spear-like thing, which as soon as you hit anything would break anyway. So that's what they look like. As to how they're used, as we said, these are men as close combat weapons. Their idea is to get right up close so that the scythes can do real damage. So I mentioned earlier that one of the scholars had suggested that these chariots have been made to fight hoplite armies, to break up hoplite formations. And the problem with this is that hoplites, you know, they have all the spears pointing forwards. And as we progress into the Hellenistic period, we start with spikes, you know, p uh, pikes p pointing forward. So even more spears. And the problem with this is that horses will not charge a wall of spears, or at least not willingly. And if they do, they're not going to end, come out of that very well. And it's acknowledged, you know, that if you've got the cavalry, you're not going to want to charge head on into this wall of spikes. You're going to want to charge from the flank or the rear. And I would just point out that, well, chariots are also drawn by horses. So if the horses of the cavalry aren't going to charge these spears, why would the horses of the chariots charge these spears? It doesn't make any sense. And when we look at the different instances where they're used in different battles, every time they try and send chariots against uniform hoplite phalanxes, they are hilariously ineffective. And this is particularly seen at the Battle of Kunaxa in 401 BC. It's also seen elsewhere. They're not that successful at Galgamela against Alexander the Great's army. And it just doesn't work. The few instances where we know that the Scythe Chariot is successful tend to be against lighter troops who are caught out of formation. So it seems that they're more like a specialised form of heavy cavalry that's meant to sort of either catch people off guard or create a gap in the line. They're not meant to just charge an unbroken line. So this is why I have a problem with this idea that 
they were invented at that particular time to fight the hoplites it doesn't really make sense it doesn't fit what we know horses can do and it doesn't really fit what we see them doing on the battlefield and the final argument to that is in at the battle of Kunaxa, so Artaxerxes the king of Persia has scythe chariots he sends his against the Greek mercenaries fighting for Cyrus the Younger but Cyrus the Younger also has scythe chariots in his army and Artaxerxes doesn't have any hoplites so if they're meant for hoplites why did Cyrus bother lugging them all the way from Sardis you know that costs a lot of money it's a logistical problem so it doesn't seem that that's what they're meant for it seems they're meant more to engage with the lighter troops and possibly scare troops with that psychological effect of having not only the horses charge at you but also the chariot and all those spikes and scythes that look pretty terrifying and they can sometimes be very very successful we know Appian gives us a very graphic account at the later battle of Amnias when Mithridates is using them of these scythes cutting people in half and scaring everybody and everyone's getting really scared of them and nobody wants to be anywhere near them they can also be absolutely disastrous when it doesn't go very well as you said earlier chariots didn't want to get close to the enemy because they're very easily broken you know and if chariots come to a stop they're much like sitting ducks and the most i think notorious example of these chariots not working very well is the battle of magnesia for the seleucids in 190 bc against the romans so they're positioned on at the front of the left wing of the Seleucid army. It seems like they were intended to open the battle on that side. Eumenes, who's allied with the Romans on the other side, sees them and very quickly attacks them with his archers and his slingers, scares all the horses, which causes the, chariot, the horses and the chariots to panic and fall back onto their cavalry behind them, and it causes absolute chaos. So at the same time, there are problems with a chariot that is meant to actually engage with an enemy and not stay at a distance because horses they're only animals as well so you know they can they panic if you know you've got arrows flying all around them and they don't turn very well so if they want to fall back that usually causes a lot of chaos on whoever's behind them horses are skittish animals i mean that's one of the things that we should add also of course they don't they don't like to be in in surrounded by a lot of noise and by a lot of pointy things so they 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 try to avoid that so horses in if used for warfare they have to be specifically trained to sort of try to repress that that instinct but it, it's never fully gone so yeah as soon as you present them with danger they have a tendency to 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 bolt back and something maybe we should touch at least for the bronze age if chariots had to to cover a long distance if you move chariot armies from one place to another, the, the chariots were usually disassembled. So they would have taken the, the chariots apart. Uh, there are reliefs that show, you know, uh, wagons with wheels and, and chariot parts on there. So that sort of adds to that idea of the cost. I don't know if that also happened with, with, city, with scythe chariots or whether they were heavy enough that they could, that they could survive the, 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 the transit. Or if, um, it, it seems to me like you always want to keep the chariots in the best condition. So you should take them apart and assemble them on the battlefield. I don't know if that's also happened with, with scythe chariots or if you even know. We don't hear anything. I would assume that they're taken apart because otherwise how are you going to get them from one place to another because you're not going to have just a nice open plane all the way to wherever you're going i think the most logical thing is to just take them apart and reassemble them when you want them but yeah we don't hear anything i'd love to know more about the logistics of things but no one is ever interested to tell us <laughs> no, no 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 but the, the logistics of transporting chariots is is even worse than just transporting you know, cavalry, because you have more horses, you have the, the feed for the horses, you have the uh, the crews, you have the the carts with the, the, the wagon, the, the chariot parts on there, which have to be pulled by oxen or whatever, which also need to be fed, which also need drivers. It's, it's, it's this and gigantic... And then you had elephants. No, and water. The most well. important thing is water. Yeah, of course. You need like... to bring water. That's why Herodotus also. says that when the Persian army is on the move, they, they empty the rivers, basically, when they stop to drink. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it, it's all this, that's usually something that, that's sort of obscured when we talk about, you know, battles here and battles there. It's all the logistics that's behind there and the difficulty of provisioning the, the, the animals and the, the, the humans that are part of the, of the armies as well. It's these 
gigantic uh, uh, operations, basically. So, yeah, if you just imagine these scythe chariots that are also heavier and have all these metal components that you have to transport all of that crap <laughs> to where you need to go. <laughs> it's like, it's it's so much stuff. Uh, yeah, it's, it's mind-boggling. Yeah, so um, the scythe chariot, we talked a little bit about the royal iconography of uh, uh, Egyptian kings and uh, neo-Syrian kings on chariots. Does it also happen in the in the uh, in the Seleucid uh, kingdom or in other Hellenistic kingdoms where you have iconography that sort of ties into that? Yeah, well, as I said, we don't have any iconography of actual scythe chariots, which is incredibly frustrating. But we do see chariots in other circumstances. The Seleucids, in particular, have the famous um, elephant chariot coins to celebrate the Battle of Ipsus. So it's I think it's Athena Nike in a chariot being pulled by elephants. And as I said before, we do see elephants in pulling chariots. There's somewhat the ba- the um parade at Daphne in 165 BC. But obviously that isn't reflective of military realities. You're not going to put your elephants on the battlefield pulling chariots. Elephants have their own problems. We do not need to complicate it with chariots. So we do see that obviously we hear of processions of people in chariots. I know the Ptolemies have a grand procession and they've got like statues of the gods being pulled by chariots and then there's alexander who's being pulled by chariots and you see again similar things on coins there but it's irritating because there's no scythe chariot so i'd like to it'd be great to say oh look there's the scythe chariot there and then there's things like the alexander mosaic that's got darius in his chariot now how much you want to read into propagandistic mosaics is another thing entirely but we do see kings being pulled by chariots it's still a very prestigious ceremonial thing and that goes i think all the way through the period you see the romans in chariots as well and things so yeah yeah during the 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 roman triumph where the the conqueror would also ride in a chariot and that sort of stuff yeah it's um speaking about gods in chariots i mean if you look at the at the, the bronze age Aegean, you also have images of chariots being pulled by griffins for example and then also uh, women aboard those chariots where they think you know these might be goddesses or something uh, it, it has the the um Ayatriada sarcophagus has uh, some of this imagery on there as well which may be a good segue to sort of talk about periods where we're not exactly sure if chariots were, were used practically i'm thinking about archaic greece for example and we can turn to josh also to talk about uh, the italian situation i i actually had a question for sylvanan real quick um so there's a mention in diodorus when Ophelos marched to meet agathocles uh trying to invade carthage or Punic territory, um, Ophelos brought supposedly a hundred chariots, three hundred charioteers, and quote men to fight beside them. Okay. Is that something common in Hellenistic armies that we read about, like men fighting beside chariots? I'm not really heard of it in a chariot context. I haven't spent as much time looking at the Carthaginian situation, except for the elephant stuff. Um, it wouldn't surprise me too much, though, because we do hear, well, the parallel I can think of is the elephants, and they are usually with a specific tr- core of light troops who fight alongside them to protect them, and, you know, to protect them from being attacked by other infantry and things. And there's some suggestion that some heavy cavalry might have had lighter troops who fought fight alongside them again to protect them so it wouldn't surprise me if that's something that does happen that you know you are to fight with that chariot or at least try to protect that chariot obviously chariots move a lot faster than infantry so these have to be light infantry i have but i haven't heard of it much but when we do all the seleucid chariots they're very sporadic and we don't hear very much about them anyway the only time we properly hear about them is magnesia and they don't do anything other than destroy the, their own troops. So. <laughs> okay, I, I I thought I'd ask just because uh, I don't know. Ophelos is a very weird figure here. He's marching from Cyrene as a Ptolemaic governor, essentially. So it's yeah. a a weird situation. I didn't know if it was more common in the Hellenistic East, maybe. The only thing I can think of that's sort of similar, there's a reference in Thucydides somewhere, it's in my PhD thesis, so I would have to look it up precisely, but there's a reference to Hamipoi, 
Uh, and he mentions them as being people that fight alongside horses, uh, yeah. which is also equally mysterious. And again, the idea is that you have like cavalry and you have like these dudes that run alongside them with javelins or whatever to, to try and, and protect the, uh, the the guys on the horses and, and especially the animals, I would presume. So it's in Thucydides somewhere. Some some people argue that that's what the uh, Ippodromoi Siloi that Galon supposedly had in his army um, at the Battle of Himera were, but I recently argued that that's stupid. So <laughs> I'm probably wrong. I, I don't think the peer reviewers were all that convinced by my argument. So no, the frustrating bit is that a lot of this stuff, you know, th- these people write these texts and they know exactly what they're what they're talking about, and then thousands of years later we read this and we have we don't have the context, so we have no idea what the hell they're talking about. I I mean I don't know if Herodotus knew what he was talking about. I doubt I doubt that man knew much about what he wrote. Um, but in this instance, it's the only use of that phrase in, in the Greek corpus, so. I genuinely don't know that he really understood what he was writing about. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, then, then to turn back to what we what we might or might not know with the the, the hypothetical use of, of chariots. So you have um, we, we talked about you know Bronze Age chariots and um, depictions of chariots in Greek geometric art, uh, which sort of leads into archaic Greek art where you also still see chariots and you see chariots used in a clearly mythical context. So the Battle of the Trojan War and all this sort of stuff. Uh, battles during the Trojan War, that sort of stuff. Um, and you also see them in seemingly realistic scenes where it's not obvious that they're gods and heroes fighting. And then the argument is, did the Greeks in the Archaic period still use chariots or not? And uh, I think I made the argument in my PhD thesis that they did. Uh, looking back on it, I might not be so sure. <laughs> it's it's very difficult to, uh, to, to sort of disentangle uh, fact from fiction there. The argument has been made that uh, because a lot of these uh, chariots are drawn by teams with four horses, that they couldn't be used in war, that they were actually racing chariots, which, you know, considering the Neo-Assyrians and also the, the scythe chariots, doesn't seem like that's an argument that would hold water because there is no reason why you can't use four horse chariots in in a battle either you mentioned josh that the situation is sort of similar in italy and etruria where you have depictions of, of chariots that are clearly inspired by greek depictions and greek use of chariots um and where there's also the issue did they actually use them or not and of course the, the frustrating thing is that chariots keep popping up throughout history like Sylvanan also showed within with her Hellenistic example of the, the scythe chariots they do keep popping up and they do keep being used so it's very difficult to sort of decide are these realistic are these used in in battle in Etruria in the 6th century in Greece in 7th century or whatever so I don't know if you want to say something about that especially also for the I mean, I mean, personally, I don't think that um, Etruscan warfare ever really saw the use of chariots. Um, chariots start appearing in a Etruscan context in the 8th century, um, really at the beginning of the 8th century, kind of with contact from the Eastern Mediterranean. So they were probably an element of that Orientalizing movement, which I know a lot of people, that that's a controversial term these days in concept, but I, I'm sure that they probably were an import because they look a lot like chariots from the Aegean um, there are some differences but um, not many um, the earliest chariots were what scholars tend to describe as fast chariots made with relatively lightweight wood fairly lightweight frames um, the wheels were attached to a stationary axle with big long hubs on them to grant stability and while traveling at speed um, they also had uh, the superstructure had rails that you could grab onto. Um, for some reason, the lack of evidence that they were wrapped in leather or anything has been taken to mean that they were meant to actually be held onto. I'm not entirely sure the the logic behind that. They, they sound very much like the rail chariots from from the Aegean because um, they were. In, in the in the late Bronze Age, you have different types of, of uh, chariots, and at the, in the late 13th century BC, uh, the so-called rail chariot gets introduced, 
which is a super light vehicle that's usually open and it has well it's named it's named rail chariot it has this rail uh, where you can hold on to it and um from around the same time we also have depictions on pottery where there's clearly chariot races going on um so these chariots uh may have been used in in warfare also but they were also definitely used in chariot races and this chariot type we see it in uh, art in the at the end of the bronze age and then it re-emerges during the geometric period so from the 8th century onwards uh, slightly earlier i think with bronze figurines there's a really nice bronze figurine somewhere i think it's the metropolitan museum in new york where where you can clearly see that the, the rail chariot where you can see see the rail on the entire structure and everything um, and they remain in use in Greece throughout the period. So I would not be surprised if, if those are the same types of, of, from what you described just now, that they're the same type of chariots that we also see in Italy then. And the yeah. argument is that despite depictions of them being used in combat, that they were actually used more for processions and for uh, chariot races and all that sort of stuff. That I mean, that's certainly what they were used for in Etruria. I, I think we have a couple of images... Um, somewhere of chariots in combat but the majority of chariots in quote war or military military scenes are people who appear to be hoplites you know getting on the back and um, some of the most prominent ones that were i think it's one of the elements of the vei velatri rome uh, series of relief plates that were essentially mass-produced to be used to decorate temples um, in this era, show a an infantryman preceding the chariot, uh, someone who is kitted out like a hoplite getting on the chariot, and then a man on horseback kitted out like a hoplite behind them following up. And, I mean, the, the scenes are very, very much Greek. They're made by probably Etruscans or Italic peoples of some sort. Um, but whether or not that is a realistic depiction of someone going to war, I, I really doubt it. I mean, maybe, maybe ceremony, ceremonially leaving a city because we do, we have good evidence that chariots were used in Etruscan processions, whether religious, political, um, or other things like that. But I, I just don't see a real use for them. Um, anyone can go out and read my PhD thesis if they want to learn about Etruscan warfare. Um, it's it's public now, and I just I don't see a place for them in in the warfare of Etruria. Um, but we know that the Etruscans loved horse racing. Um, we have just a ton of depictions of horse races from Etruria in you know tomb paintings, vase paintings. We even have what are clearly racing chariots wrecking on Carnelian uh, gemstones carved in Etruria. Um, someone has made an argument that actually the Etruscans were mildly obsessed with like the, the image of a, of a race chariot wrecking itself, which I find morbid. Um, because there had to have been a lot, of, a lot of death between horses and people when that happened. But we actually do see a later development in Etruria of um, chariots that don't have um, rails to hang on to that we call walking or parade chariots typically. They actually had a really low superstructure so a passenger would not be able to really balance without holding on to the driver, which we see depicted, um, like a passenger holding the shoulder of the driver while the driver balances themselves with the reins. Um, and we, we have a handful of these that have survived because the Etruscans buried carts and chariots with people um, in both inhumation and cremation uh, burials and they were really highly decorated um, there's an example in the Metropolitan Museum in New York um, the Monte Leone uh, chariot that has beautiful bronze plaques on three sides on the front and then the two sides of the superstructure um, probably depicting scenes from the life of Achilles I think is what the general consensus is but uh, they were obviously ceremonial in nature um, that type of chariot may have been used for racing as well because obviously a, a, a race driver doesn't need to be holding on to anything but the reins for balance Etruscans probably also used chariots for hunting 
uh, I think we have one or two scenes that indicate that may have been the case, but mostly they were a status symbol. As I believe almost everything is, though. Yeah, yeah, hunting scenes. I know there's um, there's um, from the Aegean Bronze Age gems and stuff that also have hunting scenes involving chariots, where the where a lot of people claim that you know it's impractical in in the Aegean landscape to use a chariot to chase boar because you will end up stuck in a little bog of which there were many more in ancient times than there are now or you know we run into a thicket or something so the argument is that those were probably borrowed from asia and egypt after you know royal imagery of of the king hunting and all that sort of stuff yeah you mentioned the the departure scenes there there's loads of them of course also on greek pottery exactly the same where you have a heavily armed guy uh, stepping onto a chariot waving goodbye and all this sort of stuff so the question is is this really someone who used a chariot to go to the battlefield or is this something mythologizing or something similar in the etruscan context i i could easily see it being a real scene of people departing the city again just because we know that chariots were so prominent in etruscan um parades or processions for whatever reasons so i could easily see it being part of a ritualistic you know, departure of the army. Because we do, depending on how much you trust the Roman evidence to be, um, a, real examples of early Italian practices, we know that warfare was highly ritualized in the Iron Age. So, it makes sense. The I, You know, the idea of, in Rome, crossing the Pomerium, you know, the army wasn't supposed to come into the city or cross the sacred boundary and if that was indeed an Etruscan practice, there could be some you know, ritual or some truth behind this, behind what we see in these departure scenes. But, I mean, obviously, with, with no literary evidence of any substance, it's, it's always going to be speculation. Now, I think in, in the Greek case also, there are, there are examples of chariots being used in processions. I mean, of course, um, Pisistrates abusing... Uh, the chariot to have uh, who was it again uh, pretend to be Athena driving into the city anyway I'd have to look it up precisely but that that's one instance and I think there are Greek vase paintings of uh, brides being taken to uh, their uh, prospective husbands houses in a chariot and that sort of things uh, if, if I recall correctly there was a civilization in the central Mediterranean that used chariots in war up to a relatively late period, actually, and that was Carthage. Really from the beginning of uh, the classical period, what we know of Carthage right up to the end of it, they were fielding chariots in war. Um, what information we have for the campaign that led to the Battle of Himera in about 480, they brought maybe up to 400 chariots across from North Africa, you know, those numbers are probably way inflated because 300,000 infantry is certainly a lie. <laughs> um, but uh, all the way up to when Agathocles, or, uh, when, you know, I think it was when Agathocles invaded North Africa, they were able to send out about 2,000 chariots from the city itself, which to me means that they were a garrison in the city. Um, but they never really seem to be all that effective. Um, we we have a bit of narrative of them fighting at the Battle of the Chromissus, which Timoleon, uh, Corinthian uh, tyrant slayer in the 4th century, came over to remove the tyrants from Sicily and met the Carthaginians at a river crossing, kind of ambushing them, supposedly. And... Uh, Interestingly, the Punic chariots and the Greek cavalry ended up apparently in like a standing fight with each other at one point, which is a very interesting thing to note for me at least, that you know, the Carthaginians seem to be using these chariots almost like heavy cavalry that get to a place and then you just start stabbing from the platform. Yeah, that's sort of what they sometimes suggest that the Hittites also did, but I'm I'm not entirely convinced in that case. <laughs> it does it it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to use either cavalry or chariots in that way, but it was also an exceptional battle that we actually have a narrative for, which is nice. 
working in the central Mediterranean, I don't get many of those. So we also touch upon chariot races. Is this something that the ancient Egyptians also did or not? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, so no chariot races. No, no games involving chariots. Yeah. The Etruscans were obsessed with chariot racing, from what we know and what people argue. It seemed that uh, the chariot races were civic events and also um, funerary events. Yeah, well, of course, like funeral games, what you also see in, in the Homeric epics, where you have where they organize the funeral games for dead heroes, and then they also have chariot races as, as a fixture of that. But, I mean, chariot racing was, like, the most popular sport in the ancient world from, what, the archaic period at least to the end of the Roman Empire. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you mentioned the, the Etruscans being obsessed with uh, wreck the, the wrecking of chariots, but doesn't that sort of feed into, I mean, it's not you saying that, but it's someone you cited, but doesn't that feed into the idea that the Etruscans were far more uh, bloodthirsty than uh, than regular people that have this obsession with? Ah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that that's definitely just <laughs> propaganda. Anti-Etruscan propaganda. But... No, it it is interesting because I think a lot of um, Etruscan racing chariots were bigas or um, trigas, so two horse or three horse chariots. But obviously, in the Greek world, it's the quadriga that is the the popular racing chariot, or at least the popular race, because I know they still had two horse races and things. But um, the the Sicilian tyrants love to advertise their victories in the quadriga race at any of the Panhellenic games. What what was there chariot racing in the Seleucid Empire? Not that I've come across, but the Greeks do love racing and they love games and they love processions, so it it wouldn't surprise me. But not that we hear of. But then, no one is interested in the Seleucid Empire unless they're fighting somebody in the West, usually. So, <laughs> I know the problems about sources. Like one of the things when we say, "Oh, you know, chariots keep popping up." What is really weird with the scythe chariot is. We hear about it at Kunaxa in 401. We then hear about it again at Daskaleum in 395, where it is actually very successful. We then don't hear about it at all until the Battle of Galgamela in 331. And then, again, we don't really hear much of Scythe Chariots until um, Seleucus supposedly has 120 with him at the Battle of Ipsus in 301 BC. We've no idea what they were supposed to be doing at Ipsus. Most people are quite happy to just ignore them and pretend they didn't do anything because it's hard to see how they fit in our understanding of that battle. We then hear of them just before the Battle of Sehestica, so 285, so not that long after. And then they completely disappear until Molon revolts um, in 220 BC. So he's the satrap of Media. He revolts against King Antiochus III. And... We're told that he has 10 scythe chariots in his army, which is not a lot. And it's debated, has he brought them along just because he knows the king has elephants? Or Again, we have no idea what they do in that battle. We're told they're put at the front. We don't hear anything else. And then we don't hear of chariots again until the Battle of Magnesia, which is like another 30 years, is it? In 190 BC. So it's like they just keep dropping out of the record. And we don't know whether that's genuine and they're only used in a few instances or whether they fell out of use and then they get revived because, ooh, those, those are cool, we should use those again. Or whether it's a case of we just don't have the sources for them. So that's something that's really interesting when we're talking about how chariots survive and why they keep being used. M- one of my biggest questions when I was doing my PhD was like, why does Antiochus bring them with him to Magnesia? other than they look impressive. It's like, they've not been used in the Seleucid Empire for 30 years. They've not been used by a Seleucid king, as far as we know, for almost 100 years. Why does he just suddenly decide, you know what, chariots. We're going to use some chariots. And it probably would have been better for him if he decided not to bring the chariots, to be honest. Yeah. (laughs) There's the... um, um... The, the last use, I think the cat is complaining because he wants food because it's dinner time for him. Um, there's the, one of the, the very late uses of the chariot is with uh, Boudicca, of course, against the, the Romans. Um, I don't know if anyone has any uh, immediate knowledge about that <laughs> to, to share. 
Because I'm a bit rusty as far as my... Uh... I think there's some claims that some of the Celts may have had scythe chariots as well, but I really don't know. It's not my area at all. No, I don't know. Okay, no, no. Because I, I don't remember it exactly either anymore. Just it was popped into my head as one of those late instances of still chariots being fielded into the, the, the battlefield, even though they didn't have a large number, if I recall correctly. And it's mostly, of course, this image of Bodica driving across the, the field. I do think wheeled vehicles are attested in, like, Latin culture, at least. I mean, I know the Indians also used chariots, but they're starting to fall out of favour by the 4th century. It tends to be the elephant that tends to be the most important one, which contrasts to the earlier Indian epics where everyone's on a chariot. Um, I think which sort of mirrors what we see with, like, the Homeric epics and things. Yeah, yeah, the, in the Homeric epics, every hero has a chariot, basically. And there is this weird scene of Nestor at one point organizing the army and recommending to Agamemnon that he sends the chariots this way and the infantry that way, and uh, which is uh, mystified because they, they don't do anything with it. As with a lot of Nestor's advice, he has all this wisdom that he spouts and then nobody does anything, <laughs> anything with it. They never, they never seem to fall. They always say, oh, Nestor is so wise, but they never listen to him, basically. <laughs> Very rarely. Um, yeah, but also there it, with, with Homer, of course, the, the, the question is, what, what is Homer describing? Is this real? Uh, what does this have to do with anything? Um, the idea that he's describing some kind of Bronze Age practice, which has been argued in the past, is uh, nonsensical. I think there's no evidence for that, least of all because uh, Homer's uh, heroes always have uh, chariots with four horses. And in the Bronze Age, for the Aegean at least, we only have evidence for chariots with two horses. So immediately it sort of falls apart there. Um, but yeah, how it exactly works, and the argument has been made that because Homer describes these four-horse chariots, uh, that he's mostly thinking about racing chariots, which is what he would have been familiar with anyway. Uh, so again, we come back to that situation of, you know, in, in the late Iron Age and the Archaic period in Greece, like in Italy and Etruria at around the same time, do they still use these chariots in warfare or are these just racing chariots where they're like, oh, these would look really cool in this epic, <laughs> in this epic battle. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it, it's the action movie uh, problem where, you know, like you can have a bus, you can have a fight, you know, on the street, but you can also have a fight in a moving bus or a moving airplane or something. You know, <laughs> it just doesn't necessarily make it more realistic, just makes it more... Uh, Add more horses. It looks more impressive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Homer, the Michael Bay of his era. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, Achilles' horses even talk. <laughs> he starts a conversation and they start talking back to him as well. <laughs> Very realistic. No, uh, yeah, but anyway, it's the... Uh... If explosions and lens flare existed in Homer's day, the Iliad would just be nothing but explosions and lens flare. <laughs> Don't forget slow motion. Oh, yeah, slow and slow motion. motion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fighting the river in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> All I have to say is chariots are cool. Yeah, no, they they are cool, which is probably why they keep popping up in uh, in the sources and in the iconography and everything else. They are cool. So, well, they're they're a break from especially you know later periods like in once Rome became dominant. I mean. Chariots are different than your day-to-day -day carts, which were probably extremely common by that period. So, I mean, they're the only wheeled vehicle moving fast for a few thousand years. So, Yeah, I mean, like you said, an Egyptian chariot can go up to nearly 40 kilometers an hour. I mean, 40 kilometers an hour in the ancient world. That's that's pretty quick. <laughs> it's practically the speed of light. It's... Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh... it's a Ferrari. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I mean, if you could, uh, what is it that they say that in the ancient world an army could move up to forty kilometers in a day or something along those lines? Uh, Julius Caesar was able to move further, but you know, if you have a, a vehicle that could go forty kilometers an hour, in theory, you could you could do that distance in one hour instead of eight. So, sort of makes it seem more impressive even though horses are not are not you know uh, long distance runners so more sprinters but still there, there is only one thing that i i have always wondered about chariots and warfare and i don't know if we have any mention of this in the narratives what happens when one member of the horse team is killed and is still reined to the chariot well if it's still reined to the chariot the chariot topples i think 
The the yeah so uh, there I vaguely recall something about a, a system to quickly loosen a horse that's injured or otherwise troublesome to continue with. So but yeah like I said there there is but I I, I should have looked this up but I didn't. Uh, there are instances of chariots I think with the Neo Assyrians where they have like four horse chariots but they have an extra horse attached just in case it's like a backup horse so if one of the horses has to be let go or you know has to be left behind or whatever then they can swap it out for this other horse um but i would need to look up the reference exactly because I, I think it was the neo assyrians but i'm not sure so you know like a spare tire you would have a spare horse basically <laughs> <laughs> just nice and morbid <laughs> yeah nice and morbid yeah exactly uh, and otherwise, yeah, I mean, if you if if a chariot comes at you at full bore and you manage to throw a spear and hit the horse in such a way that it's immediately crippled or dead, yeah, I, I imagine all the horses would trip and the chariot would basically be launched up into the air. So that's uh, there, there. You have your Etruscan wrecked, car- wrecked chariots again. <laughs> There's uh, there in uh, the movie Troy. There is a scene of a chariot or multiple scenes of chariots being launched into the air after the horses are crippled yeah I, I know I've seen that I've seen that in a few movies and always thought that was a little over the top yeah 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 it's well you know instead of normally you would have a car flip over and explode but you can't have that so this time you have a chariot flip over and create loads of dust for the same effect but that's the thing if the chariot just stops you, unless you're holding on to that chariot you're going to go flying off it yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, there are no seat belts or anything. I mean, you're just standing on that platform. Uh, it, maybe if you have the reins tied around your waist, like they sometimes show in 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 art, that maybe I don't know. But then you know, if if the 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 horse manages to bolt away from the chariot, you're basically dragged off a lot behind the horse. So I don't know. Not that I would want to be anywhere on an ancient battlefield, but being a charioteer really doesn't seem like a good position to be in. No, that's why mostly they kept their distance, I think. I mean, if you just sort of drive around, you know, casually, and you have some guy shooting, you know, loosening, loosing arrows at the enemy, then it's, uh, then I can imagine it's not that stressful. But yeah, as soon as you get yeah. closer, if you use like the scythe chariots and you have to get closer to, to, to cut the legs under an elephant or whatever. Uh, like, well, we can offer you a box. He's like, no one can you, but you can have a box. State of the art box is guaranteed to keep you safe. <laughs> Do we know the social status of scythe chariot drivers at all? Um, no, we don't really hear about it. I mean, I think chariots themselves are probably prestigious weapons. They're only, it's going to be the elite that keep them or the kings that keep them because horses aren't cheap. The chariot isn't cheap. But I don't think we hear of anyone like high ranking actually driving the chariots. They tend to be in charge of the infantry or the cavalry. Occasionally they're like in charge of the elephants, but again unless you're in india they're not riding the elephants so yeah i would you know even if even if you were an elite that had kept up the chariot teams and everything i mean a scythe chariot honestly just sounds like a suicide weapon in a lot of ways to me personally looking at it from the outside i would not get in my own chariot no I don't even think with I the box <laughs> guaranteed to keep you safe and keep the rain off your head and that's a good point to wrap up my thanks once again to joshua hall ariana sacco and special guests sylvan and jarrod if you like what we do and want to support us consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash ancient world mag and in that context i would like to thank some of our patrons notably rachel mcmillan pratt rachel k bicknell joshua a scott k gray momay chaos magic andrew hughes Tony Santangelo, Carolyn Dolgenos, Brooke Fairfield, and Mark Thompson. A very special thanks to Rachel Harris, and last but not least, Brent Wackholder. If you want to learn more about the ancient world, please also visit our website at ancientworldmagazine.com. Thank you very much for listening, and see you next time. Bye-bye.